Seek first to understand, then to be understood. This channel is about exposing fake gurus, unethical marketing, and charlatan behavior. And in order to do that, I must know all industries inside and out and know how they operate better than those selling it. I must first understand them before I can criticize. My guest today has been a consultant of numerous successful MLM companies, was interviewed by Larry King, and has made tens of millions of dollars as a network marketer. He also destroyed Dan Locke on his YouTube channel. My conversation with Tim is a logical and reasonable discussion about the criticisms of the MLM industry. This video is not an emotional attack on an industry as a whole. This is a chance for all of us to understand it better so that we can call out charlatans when we see them. I hope you enjoy. Tim Sales, I watched you deconstruct Dan Locke. So for my audience, they're gonna love you because I felt like those videos were excellent. How enjoyable was it to make those videos? Um, that's funny. Um, it's a consistent thing that I see. And especially when somebody is very antagonistic and loud, you know, it reminded me of boxing and kickboxing and various different things. And anytime somebody got mad, they always lose because <laughs> they lose their temper. <laughs> they don't know which way to swing. They don't know. Yeah. So by the way, those watching it, it, check out Tim's videos of Dan Locke after this. You will enjoy it. I promise. So I had to start with that. But anyway, um, so first question I have for you, just so we can get on the right level playing field. How would you define network marketing? Okay. So uh, now I had to load up my board. I don't know what you're going to ask me, but I had to load up my board with pot potentials because I like to use visuals so, uh, so that you can kind of do comparison because uh, I can give you a definition but without a comparison. It's not relative data, if you will. So the best way to compare it would be a job it has a building, just like network marketing. They have executives, they have policies, they have products and services, they have employees, and they offer a salary. No upside potential. Network marketing, they have the exact same things except for the marketing arm of the company, they say, yes, you can have the upside potential, but no salary. That, to me, is the very best way to compare it. And then, you know, if you want to go deeper on that, I can. Sure. Um, so how did you get into network marketing? Because if I'm correct, you've been in it for a long time. So go back to the start. How did you get into it? What year was you born? <laughs> 1990. <laughs> okay, so you were 10 years old. Uh, no, that's when I went in the military. So you were uh, in 1989 was when I joined. Um, so believe it or not, I did do a little bit of investigation on you, by the way. Uh oh. Um, believe it or not, uh, this is my whole track. I'm 59 years old. And um, right here, I was in uh, Navy Spec Ops over here. I did, uh, did a lot of lawn mowing as a boy uh, when I was 13 years old, all the way up to a, where I went in the Navy. And then um, right here, rental properties. I was in your world. Woo real estate. Anyway. <laughs> and so uh, I, it, this is way before your time, but a guy named Ed Beckley had a course and it was 20% less than market value. You throw out bids as much as you can and one caught. I didn't know anything about closing costs. And when the real estate agent said, do you have any problem coming up with this on settlement? And I was like, gulp. So I answered an ad in the newspaper for a network marketing company. I didn't know what new, uh, what new skin was. I didn't know what Amway was. I thought Amway was a track like a train because I was in Washington, DC, Amtrak, Amway. That's what I thought it was. So I had no idea what it was. So that's how I got into it uh, to, from the beginning. Okay. And if I'm correct, you are now consulting or you've definitely consulted in the past. Are you doing it currently? No. So, um, so I built new skin for five years and then I went over, I wrote a video called brilliant compensation. Uh, so about 40, Four million copies. Then I got into stock trading. Then I got into consulting. And over here, I was consulting a couple of hundred network marketing companies. This is perfect. And then, then I rejoined because I was like, over here in the consulting, where I don't know if anybody else's consultants out there, but uh, you can't win. <laughs> you can't win. They want you to help them grow their company, but you're not internally in it. You can't really create the campaigns that need to do. You can't train all the sales reps that need to happen. And so it was just a, just a disaster. Yep. So my channel, 
I always try to focus on unethical behavior. It's never like a personal attack. It's more of let's find unethical business practices, marketing, advertising in any type of industry. It's generally focused on info marketing. Um, but so with your experience, you've had quite a bit. A, has there been any times where you look at something and go, that's really unethical? Um, and B, do you mind explaining if you ever saw it from like a whole company perspective? Yeah. Okay, so now you guys are going to realize that I'm willing to tell the truth, even though I like a particular industry. Um, yeah, there's been a, a multiple times, and it was one of the reasons why um, I didn't just join. First of all, they would tell me they wanted me to consult their company, um, but what they were really trying to do was to get me in so that I would join their company. So it was a bit of deceptive. They were paying me to come in and see if they could excite me enough to join their company. And um, the other thing that I felt was unethical was that they would try to buy me. And, and this is just my opinion. I don't know how anybody else feels about it, but from my perspective, it is unethical. Okay. When, when you say and, buy you, can you, can you do a little bit more explanation on what you mean by that? <laughs> um, okay, so in the military, as a leader of men, uh, I just didn't have any women. I'm not being gender specific, but uh, I just had women, or I just had men. And so they follow you because they respect you. Okay, so yes, they have to, but they'll follow you if they respect you. And if I was paid to join a company, okay. You sit this over here and then you step over here and you say, okay, so I'm now in the recruiting mode and I'm talking to somebody and they say, why did you join this company? And I say, well, um, I love the management team for this reason, this reason, this reason. Uh, I love the products because of this, this, and this. I like the compensation because of this, this, and this. But what I leave out is they gave me $5 million to join. And that had a lot of influence on me and I can't offer that $5 million to somebody else. And so that to me starts off as a lie. In other words, I'm telling a lie every time if I were to have done that. And yeah, so, you're like an athlete endorsing a product that they don't use in a way. It's like, hey, this is a great yeah. product, but maybe they don't believe in it. So you use the word recruiting, which I think this is a word that's a very emotionally charged word within your industry. And so I want to kind of discuss how you or how distributors within network marketing go about getting customers? Because I think a lot of the criticism lies in, you know, these distributors immediately go to friends and family. So do you mind touching on how um, distributors go about finding new customers? So you were really prepared. <laughs> You've got all the, all the regular criticisms ready. 32 years. Okay. There's not been a new objection in 30 of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, to me. Right. So, all right. In my view, and all, I'm always trying to go to simplicity, Spencer. That is my rule. Bomb squad work only works if it's simple and you can make it simple for, for people. So for me, it's called a pipeline. And customer pipeline means that you're trying to sell a product. Okay. And, uh, and don't forget that recruiting word that was charged so make sure you bring that back up. This, I'm just talking about customers, but this is a pipeline. Everybody has to do the pipeline. Every time I get on my phone on Facebook or something like that, and I, I wake up in the morning and I look, there's a post, there's a post, and then an ad, a post, an ad, a post, a post, an ad. So everybody is doing the pipeline. You can see what it is, leads. And so that's what they're trying to do on Facebook. And then you contact the lead, you set an appointment, you do a presentation, you follow up, you get a customer, you serve them, you make money. I'll leave the rep part of that out for right now. We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so in network marketing, I put the word dynamic here is because you can't nail network marketing down. As much as people try to put a put it into a particular box, they can't. And the reason being is because we will use whatever works. So you see it in the coronavirus, all right? In other words, if the internet went down, we would just shift and focus. But you see where Cheesecake Factory made an announcement that to all of their landlords that they couldn't pay their 
for rent. And then all those landlords went to we can do um, trade shows, conventions, things like that. So that is how we can do it. Then I moved to this one right here. This is the one that I teach. It's called the inviting formula. And because at the end of the day, it's about making people's lives better. But you don't know whether or not your product will make their life better or not. And so therefore you have to like, like talk to them, greet them, get them talking to you. Um, you know, I, I think this is a really important aspect in that I think an ethical way to sell is to have a gatekeeping element, meaning you want to figure out, will this product benefit you? So like there might be a protein drink that I could say, Hey, Tim, you want to start going to the gym? This, I think this protein shake will, will benefit you. But if you try to slam down everyone's throat, I want you to join this protein powder. I think that's where a lot of the criticism, criticism comes in is that they, you know, people get on social media and they have a friend or two that's just, hey, this great opportunity, protein shake. Here's me at the gym with the protein shake. I want you to join. And there's never an element of, is this product even right for the person? A hundred percent. Okay. And in the context of how do I get customers, I want to be a little bit different because I don't like, I like when I get hit and I go, man, that's rude. I don't want to be that to another. So like, let's say I, I go and I say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to hide the, uh, the brand on this, but I get a water bottle and I say, you know, I go through my company and I look and I look and I say, Hmm, that's interesting. What's the selling features of that? What can I do? Right? So I take the water bottle. I learn everything that I can possibly know about the filter that's on the inside. And then I wrap a campaign around it. And that campaign may be camping. That campaign may be, you know, survival. It may be something. So that's the way then, and then I go in and I choose the pond I'm going to go fishing in, in the camping world, let's say, and then I put out an ad. Okay. So that's the way that I generate leads. Yep. You're right? just selling a product simply. I'm just selling a product. So I have a question. So you've definitely run across this in your years of experience. You've consulted. And one of my main criticisms with the MLM that even after watching your videos uh, that I still have is at the very new level, you have a new distributor that gets in and starts prom immediately. You get the sense that this person is just promoting, hey, I want you to join this business opportunity. You know, they started on a Monday and by Tuesday, they're already trying to promote business opportunities, which for me, my perspective is that that reeks of pyramid scheme, right? You have new person immediately just trying to recruit new people. Um, and so when you go consult with a company, if you come across a new distributor that is using un what I would consider unethical terminology, how would you go about maybe changing their sales process or changing the way they, they go after new customers? Okay, it's a really good question. The hardest thing in the sales world is to get someone to actually make a move because the real thing is the gym is down the street, but they have an excuse not to go to the gym. And so what, what I try to do when somebody is reaching out is just praise them for reaching out, but then just easing towards professionalism. I wrote, I read a book a long time ago and it was called consultative selling greatest book I ever read in that category because it really taught me what my, my profession is all about. I'm just helping somebody on the journey they're already on or that they want to go on. So to answer your question, what I try to do is I try to get back to this conversation. Greet, qualify, invite. That's the sequence. If, they, if you qualify them, which means does what I have help someone or could it help someone? If what we're talking about is finance, then can my business help them? If they're not talking about finance, then I'm not going to invite them. That's the, and the only time you, a salesperson ever becomes to withdraw is when he knows he pushed too hard. And so that's the way that I view the, uh, the way you're asking that question is I want to try to correct that person's behavior seeing this, but I had, it took me a long time, but I, this is bad at network marketing, mediocre, good, excellent, and elite in school. You'd have had a grade, an F, a D, a C, a B, an A. 
what I see most commonly in relationships is that the F student's going to be unprofessional, damaged relationships, they're going to state falsehoods, they're going to spam. And you would include unsubstantiated claims with the bad network marketer, right? We can both would, agree with that. I would include unstem, unsubstantiated here. Yes. Okay. Now, unsubstantiated. All right. So that is a tough one when somebody has had a personal experience because they've had an experience and it cost a billion dollars in 12 years to get a claim substantiated and no nutrition company is going to do that. And so that person had an experience. And so I understand that fire thing. And whenever you've seen any attacks on this, they never talk about whether or not it did work or not. It's just you're not allowed to claim it. Yeah, this is a very gray area, by the way. Um, so someone, and this is what's really tricky is that you see this a lot in this digital marketing world where you have the superstar, the A student probably on your chart, and they make 100 grand a year, 100 grand a month, some ridiculous claim, and they themselves can do it. And then when they start coaching or consulting, they say, here's how you can make 100 grand a month. But really, they're part of the 1% of the 1%. And it's, it might not necessarily be that, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. I do have a question. So in that chart, um, it looks like you have what you would call A players, the elite. I have a question for the people that succeed in this game, in the network marketing game, how much of their success is due to selling products and how much of their success is due to recruiting new members? Define success. So let's say success as an income that surpasses what they were able to earn. Let's just, let's just make it simple, $5,000 a month, roughly a median salary in America. You're successful if you can meet median salary. So uh, what would you, for those that meet that criteria, how, how much of their success comes from selling product versus recruiting new members? I would say in my history, I might know 10 people who have made $50,000 a year selling products. Total. Yeah. And so do you believe that most of the success comes from selling a little bit of product and then you recruit customers who become what you would consider in your downline? I believe I'm getting that correct. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Am okay. I right? Okay. So just picture this little analogy that I was, uh, I was doing and, and this has to do with role. Um, I did a video on this, but it has to do with what is the role of a person at a particular time? When I have mastered being able to get customers with, the, customers with this, is it better if I really believe in this filter? Because I know it, it gets out Prozac, it gets out all kinds of drugs and, and metals and all kinds of stuff. And it's not like, oh, it just gets out bacteria or it only gets out one thing, lead or something. And so if I really want to get it out there, is it better for me to run a campaign and do it, do it, do it? Or is it better for me to get really, really good at it? Say I get 20, 30, 40 customers. And then I give that campaign to 10 of my team members or all of them and have all of that. And so it would be like a uh, commercial, let's say, that runs on the Super Bowl is going to get a certain number of views during that hour uh, or that four hours. I can create a commercial and then distribute it to let's say 30,000 people, and they will do that for months and months and months. So you can think of the advertising portion of that that way. And so I would get out a whole lot more bottles that way than I would doing it all myself. That makes really sense? Understand. Which by the way, the, the actual business model, as long as everything's done legally and ethically is, is really well thought out by the way. Right? It's a very strong business model. And I think that's why some of these companies are worth like billions of dollars. I think Herbalife is, I don't know if they're the biggest, one of the biggest. And eight. I think this is, which by the way, they're eighth? Eight billion. Eight uh, billion, Amway oh, okay. Is, eight, Amway is 10 billion. Wow. And so this is where, I'm going to stay in the middle on this, but this is where I think a lot of people who want to be in the anti-MLM crowd, I think this is where they start to get a little uneasy, where... It, you don't really feel like the people that are succeeding are doing so simply because they're selling product. They're succeeding because they're adding new people under them. And the way you're explaining it, and, and I do believe it's legal what you're saying, but I think I'm just saying that I think that's where a lot of people start to get a little uneasy where they might start using the word pyramid, which it technically oh. is not, but 
it's starting to get in that gray area. Yeah. So I, I was, um, I was very close to the Bill Ackman uh, attack on Herbalife and I would go and I also stock trade. Um, and I go in and I like, I'm looking at these news groups and they're all like championing that this thing is going to go down and everything. And like, they don't get customers. They don't get customers, you know? And I just like in the chat, I go, how many customers do you guys have? In other words, they're trading stocks. They have no customers, but they can make money. Why is that legal? But they attack us. Right. So that it, that was my view when I saw them saying they get no customers. And I'm like, all stock traders, they don't they don't have any customers. And so also, when you look at just the corporation, the CEO doesn't himself get customers or herself get customers. Managers don't. Sales managers may occasionally, but their main role is to, you know, put the standards up of what the quota is and how we meet the objectives of the corporation to grow so you know he's in here there we are there we go okay i understood i understood what you're saying and this is why i respect your videos and your your stance on a lot of things is that you can logically break down something an issue and you can refer it to something in our daily lives that we would not consider a pyramid scheme or whatever and you're absolutely right like i think if you're going to be an anti-mlm i think you do have to at least at least concede the point that ceo's purpose is not to be down right in computer code the CEO's purpose is to hire two man, you know, a sales manager, a techno, techno, a technology manager, a marketing manager, and then delegate. And so, I, I, yeah, I can see your point on that one. Since you brought up the CEO and the uh, the re that recruiting word just popped into my head. When you think about recruiting, I like to view it more like, okay, so what is the difference? I uh, I showed over here. What is the difference between this and this? This one for the marketing arm, it recruits. Now, if you've ever been around human resources department, their entire job is to recruit. That's literally uh, the term. Yeah, their name. Placement. Yeah, recruiter. Yeah. 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 And so their job is placement. Their job is recruiting. You get 61,000 employees at Delta or used to. Um, they had to be recruited. And the only difference is you're going to get the upside potential of Delta or we're going to give you a salary with no upside potential. That is the difference. So, right. And so in regards to this, I think where a lot of people in the anti MLM space that are going to attack you is say, well, with network marketing, you have to spend money to have the not job, but you, to, to have the opportunity. Whereas with a job, you show up from day one and you perform whatever the task is. And I think that's where a lot of people like to critique MLMs. Is there any type of response you have to that? Man, I would, if I believe in this, so if I believe in the pipeline, if I believe in my ability to generate a lead, to contact the lead, set appointment, do a presentation, follow up, if I believe in that, I would never want a salary. Fair. In other words, anytime I've had, and I've, I've owned other businesses, when I have a sales rep who sits in front of me, he wants a job, he's got a resume, he's got all these things and what he did. And, and I say, you ever seen this? And he goes, uh, the, yeah, I've, I've seen it said differently, but yeah. And I go, do you believe you can do that? Now I just looked at his resume, Spencer. He just claimed to be the greatest of the greatest. And so, and I say, do you want a commission? Because I'll give you three times more than just a salary plus commission. Do you want this as a salary or do you want this as a job? And he goes, well, I would need a base pay, a base pay. What does that mean? And he goes, well, you know, just the ups and downs, you know, my wife would prefer that I have an income that's coming in. So who does he want to cover his butt when he doesn't do this? He wants you. That's right. So I will say, but if I had not watched your videos, I would have hammered on this a little more because I felt like there was an answer that you could have given that would have, would have really handled this. And so let me backtrack. I'm a real estate yeah. agent in Ohio. And I started, when I watched your videos, I started realizing, okay, with a real estate agent, I had to spend money to, to become an agent. And I spend a monthly, uh, I have a monthly expense to maintain my agency. And my career, I had to go out and pay for an education two different times. And so I think if, if I was on your side, if I wanted to defend your position, I would say that there are 
jobs out there that we would consider completely normal. Like everyone knows real estate agents and they have to sign up to play the, play the game and they get the upside potential too. And so I think when I saw that argument that you made in one of your videos, I, I felt like it was a very fair argument. I have a question since you brought up uh, real estate. Um, when you Google the average income of a real estate agent, what do you get? I would imagine 25 to 40 grand at best. You will. And um, I had to do, okay, so let me give you just a little bit of backdrop on this. So Navy Special Operations, there is a recruitment portion. They show this video of guys getting beat up, okay? And they, but then at the end, they're standing proud, right? And that's supposed to recruit people. Well, they show it to us in boot camp, and there was two of us that went over to that table and signed up. And everybody else was like, you idiot. <laughs> um, that was a recruitment video. And then it was attrition gate after attrition gate. In other words, if you can get through the eye test, you had to have perfect eyes to defuse bombs, right? If you can get through the eye test, okay, you got through that gate, or you were stopped at that gate. And then it was the physical fitness test. And then it was the dive test. And then it was blah, blah, blah. Okay. Gates of attrition. And when I saw network marketing and I've experienced it, I saw gates of attrition. And when I look at real estate and I look at the average incomes of $48,000, I said, uh, uh, where did that start? Did that start with all licensed real estate agents? Or did it start with only those who sold a house this year? In other words, if it came from the IRS, then it was probably they had to have sold at least one house. Okay. So when I dug into it, I, uh, here's what I found. So I don't know if you can see this from where Not you quite. are. Just, so yeah, you can explain it a little bit. Okay. So, this right here is how many agents, real estate agents, are created every year, 50,000. But I found this little tiny place down in Texas, and it was a government organization that said 44% passed. I'm like, what? That means if you just did algebra, you just, you'd say, well, that took 113,000 people taking the test to have 44% pass. And then when you start digging into it, you'll find they got to take it 1.5 times. And so you needed to have 142 to start that. Well, wait a minute now, they had to finish a course, a pre-course. That would have required them to have, and, and, and man, <laughs> that's 75 hours of contract and regulatory law. Yeah, mine was 120, I think. How much? 120 hours. Oh, <laughs> I can write that down. <laughs> 120 hours. Oh my gosh. I can't get somebody to watch a 20 minute video on my YouTube channel. Are you kidding me? Uh, maybe 120. I can't remember. It, it was a lot though. 90 hours, okay. maybe somewhere around there. Yeah. It was a lot though. Okay. So let's, 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 let's give them the benefit of the doubt. 75.5. Um, I did a weight loss program and it was like four hours and didn't matter all the results that I was getting. People won't watch it. So anyway, all the training on it. Okay, so it meant you had to start with 710,000 in order to get 50,000 new agents every year. And so what they're showing right here, this line is where the National Association of Realtors start the statistics. So that means they're only exposing, they cut out 93% of the attrition gates to say, once you become an agent, now you're in the statistics. And so 5.8% of the total is gonna make 37,500. And that is, I'm sorry, not forget that line. I didn't say that. They're going to sell one home. So 5% of real estate agents are gonna sell one home. And then 3.5, is going to hit the median income of $48,690. So by this book called How to Lie with Statistics, I saw it on Bill Gates's counter. <laughs> um, 
all you have to do is omit statistics and you can really make this look great because you excluded all of this. Okay, so and now this is attrition gates, but this is income gates. And income gates depend utterly on the pipeline. So whether you sell a house or you don't sell a house is all the pipeline. Did you get yeah. out there and did you hustle? Any statistician can see, the, see where the data starts to really get murky. When you start ignoring, you know, who gave information about starting a real estate career, who took classes, who actually took the test and failed. And you actually, if you, if you include that number, the percentages actually drop. Yeah. I think yeah. this is actually, so, uh, this is your, probably your best rebuttal to the cynicism about the success rate in MLM. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes down to it is that from 700,000, you're going to have 25,000 is going to make the average income. Okay. So that's good because 25,000 people out of 50,000 that became agents, that's good. But they did have this attrition gate up here, our gates. Okay. And then 9,000 of them are going to earn $75,000 a year and 1,250 will earn $100,000 a year. Wow. Right? That's very small. If, the, if that data is correct, that is, that is marginally small. This is very accurate. Okay, so I had a group of statisticians who went into it and they are part of a statistic society where if you do something and they'll rescind your degrees. Okay, I'm talking about like, yeah, I know these numbers. Okay, now what's interesting to me, and I'll reference back to John Taylor on this, is according to the National Association of Realtors, it says income was typically commensurate with experience, with 16 years or more of experience, had a median gross income of 71,000. Okay, so John Taylor spent one year in um, trying to do new skin. Okay, so now let me compare it to others. So here is a YouTuber. You ever look at the compensation plan on YouTube? I have because I've started, I've actually started winning. So I'm going to be a part of the good statistic on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you, anybody in network marketing would say, when you look at the, uh, the compensation plan of YouTube and you go, wait a minute, are you kidding me? Um, there's 31 million, 31 million <laughs> um, channels that have five or more subscribers. Okay, so they're not even including everybody. And you cannot earn any money until you have 1,000 subscribers who also, there's a, an addendum to your comp plan, that also have 4,000 watch hours. And then and only then will they look at you as to whether or not your content is going to, that they have advertisers who want to promote on it. And so that's a tough comp plan. That's going to leave 27 million people not eligible for pay. And so here's the way it breaks down. I started with the same number here, okay? And the 710,000 over here, all 710 dropped down to here because there's no uh, course required, there's no exam and all that stuff, right? And so right here, 12.9% are eligible to earn one seventh of a penny. Wow. Where real estate is going to give them um, 37,000 of those would sell one home. 0.05 or 366 out of 710 are going to earn 57,000. Okay. And so you are somewhere in here. Okay. I've got all the breakdown. Uh, I think you're at 2.5 to 2.6. The top 2.6, you evil man, you. <laughs> I know, I'm so greedy. You're so greedy. <laughs> I may okay. even be You're higher than that. You're not making money though. off of them. Yeah. You're not making money off of them and all of that. Okay. So then it's 0. 0.26 is going to earn $100,000. And so 183 people out of 710 will do that. And then when you contrast it to, and this is where I have to be very, very precise. Okay. 
There is nobody who can tell you the average income of a group of companies unless they were internal to all of those companies. All right, that it, it, this is crazy the way people toss around John Taylor's data, okay? Which I've done, I have done. Just saying. Maybe, I'm not maybe, I'll, be number, maybe I'll be number seven anti-MLM. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um the average income is very very difficult for somebody to get because they're trying to do algebra to figure out from the comp plan how much payout is actually going to each and so it's very difficult almost impossible even if you're looking at publicly traded companies because some of those publicly traded companies you're gonna have to go into the itemized list and look and see, do they have caps in that comp plan? Do they have um, ways, in other words, like let's say that they go, we're gonna send all of our top earners on an incentive trip. And that whole incentive trip gets lumped into distributor compensation. And so you cannot parse out and actually like look at it the way that people think that they can, okay? So this company, is a company that I know every single thing on the inside, all right? Only then can I actually give a true statistic. So out of 710, just like in YouTube, everybody drops down to right there. 81% sell at least one product. 7.5, that's our big drop right there. 7.5 are 53,000 people would earn $50,000. That's two times more people than real estate. And then 25,000 would earn $75,000 a year. That's three times more than the real estate number. And 2% are 14,396 earn 110,000 compared to 1,250. I am not, let me repeat, I am not cutting down real estate or YouTubers or I think I have, um, here, is, uh, there, here are actors. What I'm trying to show is one thing. I admire, bow, and salute to any entrepreneur, to any person who says, I'm going to step out of the average. I love it, because that it, is. It. What I think is bizarre is if you look at, if you want to analyze success in any field, I was a baseball player, I played collegiately, at a, a D2 school, nationally ranked, yada, yada, yada. And if you actually look in the baseball industry at athletes, right, it forms a pyramid from high school to college. There's just a natural weeding process. And it is interesting, the more, the more objective, and you, you take away your preconceived notions about the network marketing industry, and you look at it objectively, you start to realize that pyramids are everywhere. And the success pyramid exists in any industry. Baseball, it got infinitely small. Same with others, NBA, NFL, all that stuff. Same with real estate agents, as you just explained. Same with real estate investors. Why do you think that network marketing gets such a bad rep? Because I, I got to be honest, before I came across your material, I, had, I was part of the anti-MLM crew that looked at it with the notion that you know, nobody makes money in MLM. But the way you broke it down, I'm assuming that all your data is true. The way you broke it down, it's, it, it's representative of other industries. So why do you think that network marketing gets such a bad rep when other industries do not? in regards okay. to the success all right you said something in there and i am very trustworthy and i'm going to give you the one data point that is very difficult to find okay so all of the data that i showed you in terms of real estate is accurate this number from starting the agent course to finishing the agent course is the only one and the mathematicians had to use the Pareto principle, okay? And I said, is that real? And he, and he, he said, he goes, man, <laughs> like if, you, if a statistic is unknown and it has to do with human behavior, we use the Pareto principle and that is standardized. If anybody knows the real numbers, you, you would have to go to like some, high sampling of people who offer this course and, and look at their true data. 
in order to get it. And so I just wanted to let you know that that's the only gap, if you will, that we had to like go, okay, we got to apply the Pareto principle. Okay. Yeah. So um, remind me your question again, because I just, I, when you said that, I wanted to do. Why do you think network marketing gets treated in oh. such a way in, in, in mainstream media? There's a lot of, there's a lot of conversation about network marketing being an industry where no one makes money. But as you just explained, the success metrics for network marketing is actually similar to other industries. And those other industries don't get the same bad rep in regards to, you know, only 1% of people are real estate agents. That means it's a scammy industry. So why do you think network marketing gets that bad rep in the mainstream media? Um, I honestly, I, um, I'm, I'm looking to see if I have this uh, one thing. If you watch some of my stuff, you may have seen this and this is a big deal because we rub up against the establishment a little bit. And by establishment, right? do you mean like fortune 500 companies? Yeah, just, you know, like the way things are done, you know, like the way things are, um, and I'm, uh, I'm not a weirdo, trust me, but if you ever read this book called The Dumbing Down of America, it was written by Charlotte Iserbit, and she was uh, in the Department of Education and the Government, and she documented a whole bunch of stuff. And so um, it made sense to me from the perspective of we are trained to go to school and somewhat forced to go to school. And we go through this education system. And what we're supposed to do is go out and get W-2 income. That's the way that I was trained. Yeah, that is very common. To do. And 1099 income was created for the wealthy. And by us owning our own business in network marketing, we get 1099 income and 1099 income. This is the reason that every time somebody says all that money they lost and things like that. I don't know if you saw, but everybody who bought a course in real estate. Okay. So 700,000 times about $500. You're talking about $500 million just went poof every year. And so when you think about 1099 income, the government literally pays you to advertise. They pay you to build your business. In other words, you can write it off your income, right? And so you say, well, I didn't make any money. Well, does anybody in the family, like in other words, did your spouse have W-2 income? Because you can write it off of that. Because you had to pay for those leads somehow. And so wherever you paid for those leads, you can write off as an expense. I see. So, okay, so um, real quick. That is an interesting point that I never considered. Um, I'm starting a real estate business, let's say, and I want to be an agent. I'm going to spend money on marketing. So therefore, you could argue that in order to get my first customer, I have to spend money. That's very similar in any business. And so with network marketing, it's similar where you have to spend money to make your first client. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times from then on. So I believe this model in network marketing, and as I explain it, it'll make sense, it disrupts, it causes upset. <laughs> okay, so Procter & Gamble, here's the sales rep. The sales rep says, I want a salary plus commission. And so because of that salary, they get locked into a salary contract and the contract states that they do not have future, they can't get commissions on future of that business. So this lady goes out, gets 7-Eleven, all 46,000 stores, two, not one by one, but they got the top of it. And so they were able to get 46,000 stores to sell Park and Gamble's products. Okay, that agent gets their salary, they get commission, and they probably would get to stay next year. And W-2 income is where, they, is where they get that. 40% goes to the government, about, okay? And so that is the most biggest expense that you will ever pay in your life. When you, in, at the end of life, you say, how much money did I devote to where? You're going to give most of your money in, in, in terms of categories, okay? So, but in network marketing, what they're saying to you is you and the organization that you build with a finite number of layers, okay? Four levels, five levels, six levels, seven levels deep. What you can have in sales, you get to keep as long as the sales are there. 
And that is disruptive. And I find it very interesting that the first company to be attacked in network marketing was Amway. It was like a seven year case and it, they had the same products. Interesting. Yeah, I so think, what, what you're arguing is uh, a normal structure with a company is going to be a one time. The sales rep goes out, you get a little commission, you sold one, good job, little Jimmy. But with over here with the network marketing, you get recurring. That's right. And so Procter & Gamble gets $9 billion of profit per year. Why? Because they don't have to pay out to that sales rep every single year. And in network marketing, it would be a stack of people in order to get that. I think I have a, uh, a slide on that. Just, just so it's a visual for everybody. That's a hard concept to, uh, to grasp for people who, who saw way too many of John Taylor's drawings. Um, there's a finite number of level. In other words, if you are on my third level, then I earn on what you personally sell customers, but I do not earn anything on your team. And so when you look at it that way, your job is, is to build the most productive people inside of those levels. And so that's the game and where you want to just, you know, when they say, there's just so many sayings out there and I cannot tell you where they originate other than people who are unwilling. And Spencer, this is a bold statement, but man, I got to just call it the way that it is. When people don't do the pipeline. It's the only way they can fail. I know the math. I can run just numbers. I know all the math in my organization. I know exactly how many people before there's some point where somebody's going to make $100,000 in that line. When somebody doesn't do the pipeline and for whatever reason, okay, they could be scared of it. They could find a reason why they can't find leads. They can do whatever, but the bottom line is, is that when people don't do the pipeline, they don't want to blame themselves. They want to blame this person or this person or the company or the industry. I do find, yeah, I do find that the failures typically lead to a criticism of the business model. Yeah. And I'm going to cut you off right here. By the way, uh, for those of you who are interested, Tim does a great job at actually breaking down this criticism really well in his video and it's extended. So I'm going to cut off. If, if you're interested and if you still have the criticism about the pyramid and all that, I actually would say, check out his videos. He does a great job at breaking down. I do want to move on to the next question though. Okay. So um, on the, in the documentary betting on zero, which at the time I watched and thought it was fascinating, which I'm, I'm assuming you've watched or you're familiar with the arguments. So in the video, they have a lot of emotional moments. They show the down on their luck family with a lot of product in their garage and a lot of criticism is on the MLM industry is, you know, all these people are buying all this product and then they're left, they spend all this money and are left with nothing. So do you mind having a little quick discussion about the, you know, the situation where these people are getting recruited into the network marketing and then they're buying products. So do you mind discussing a little bit, like how's that set up? Do these, do all new distributors need to buy product? Do you have to buy monthly product? And do you mind discussing that criticism? You bet. Um, okay. So you got to look at it a little bit on a historical standpoint and you say, okay, so in, in Amway way back, your requirement was to get 20 customers. That was a requirement before you would be allowed to go quote direct. Direct meant that you could order the products direct from the company. That is a quota, right? That's a quota. And then some people came along and said, <clears throat> but I've got a really big client. And they, the amount that they order is more than your 20 customers. And so would you allow me to, you know, let's base it on volume instead of number of customers. And at that point in time, you had this shift in the industry to where it was now volume. That is when garage qualified began to occur. You had a lot of water filter people or people who joined water filter companies and had stockpiles. Okay. And so then the regulators came in and said, you can't be stacking up all these products. Okay. That's harming the consumer. And so the network marketing industry shifted. They shifted to saying, okay, 
So how do we differentiate between a wholesale person and a retail customer who's just trying to buy? Because if we sell everything at wholesale, now the distributor can't make any profit selling the product. And so they created a minimum based upon government requests to have a minimum like that what you would consume in a month, no more inventory than what you could consume in a month. And so then it consolidated down to the quota ended up becoming about $150 a month or $200 a month or something like that. And so most companies have now shifted to where, no, you don't have to be on auto delivery if you have customers that cover your quota. Okay, so it's not a requirement. And anytime they're whining about this, I would have to say, all right, if you can't get two customers, you shouldn't be in any business. So just to make like, this clear, that the scenario where this, this single mom down on her luck, it, she does not have to continue you know, each month. She does not have to continue purchasing the products each month. Is that correct? Correct. She okay. doesn't, as long as she has customers. So it's important. That cover it's that important. Volume. Okay. So it's important that at first she, she per, maybe purchases some product or whatever. She, um, she might need to purchase some at the start, but after 30 days or 60 days, if she has still not acquired a single customer, there is no need for her to continue buying products. Is that correct? That's correct. Except for okay. one thing. All right. And it's a hard concept. Um, and I'm going to get back to a blank screen and I'm going to draw here. So, um, all right, there are compensations of all types. And, um, and some compensation plans, if this is you, and you have a team that has just really took off and run. All right, and so let's just say it goes down way deep. You can't earn on any more than this level until you have one more. In network marketing, you're saying? Yes, in network marketing. So you would have to have this, let's say that this volume requirement was $4,000 of volume. And this one is $4,000 of volume. Two of those will allow you to earn down to your second level. And then four of these would allow you to earn down to that level. And this, and so what people do when they have a runaway leg like that, but they haven't built the other ones, they buy volume in these people's names. That's where you get garage fulls. In other words, they're not willing to do the pipeline. And so they just buy the volume. Now I'm a little confused is, what the advantage of someone doing that would be. Well, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a month on your sixth level, you have plenty of finance to buy all this volume. Because you're buying See? it at a discount. So you're essentially buying it at a discount and hoarding. Yes. Okay. And so I like companies that create such a structure that they don't allow this. Got it. Okay. So, so do you um, feel like in the document, which by the way, I'm an editor, so I totally know how you can manipulate the viewer's minds with video and audio elements, music in that documentary. If I'm, remember correctly, there were moments where they, they do the single mom, like, hey, you have all this product, it's an industry-wide issue. Do you feel like that was kind of manipulative in a way that you feel like you could have stopped it? That's not necessary, is essentially what I'm getting at. For yeah. someone who's not having, who does not have any customers, it is not necessary for them to have $10,000 worth of product in the garage. Yeah, the only way that they would have $10,000 worth of products would be because they're trying to buy their volumes. Hmm. That's actually a, a really interesting answer because I feel like one of the huge criticisms of the network marketing industry is when you see someone you know, maybe a cousin got in, they got a bunch of protein powder and you emotionally see them and go, oh my gosh, this person lost so much money with network marketing. It's an industry-wide issue. That th th This is actually a really interesting perspective, something I did not know. I, I initially thought that you consistently had to buy every single month. Um you have to have at least some small quantity, like a quota of, let's say, $100 or $200 a month. Okay, what is my requirement to be commission qualified? I have a quota. That quota for me is about $150 of volume, which would equate to about $200.
I have enough customers that that's completely co covered, but I love this filter. I, lo I like, I know the product developer. You talk about, okay, so why would I do network marketing when I could do affiliate marketing? Well, in my experience, affiliate market, if I go to ClickBank or I go to, you know, Commission Junction or any of these programs and I look at their sales pitch and I look at their click-through rates, I look at their conversions and I say, okay, ethically, do I know this guy? <laughs> do I know who this, where they manufacture their products? Do I know? Because I'm in the inner circle of a lot of internet marketers and I see their business models and I'm like, you know, uh, a container of vitamins is landed and it's full of mice from China. And I'm like, what'd you do with it? <laughs> and he says, you know, well, any of them that weren't chewed open, you know, we, uh, we sold. Oh, wow, well, right, great. <laughs> um, I wanted to show you this, uh, one other thing about what you're talking about. Um, and John Taylor, and by the way, you get to now look at this. Everybody is saying, all you have to do is go to Google and enter FTC study and you're going to come up with what the FTC did. They did research, blah, blah, blah. No, if you look very, very closely, it is in public comments. This is not the FTC. It's on the FTC inside of public comments. Okay, so just like I get comments inside of my channel and you get comments in your channel, it's comments, okay? All right, and then New Skin responded to John Taylor's statements, okay? And right here, and uh, maybe you can zero in and on it or something, but it says, we'll refund 90% of the cost of un unused products for a year. So Herbalife has the same policy. Um, I know about probably six companies that I know for real because I work with them and I know their policies. Any legitimate company is going to provide that just as a safety measure. And when I look at it in the context of business, and say, oh, you're, you're, you're trying to tell me that you got hurt in network marketing where you, the minimum you got to sell is 200 bucks. Uh, the, you get a 30 day money back guarantee if you go, oh man, I can't do this or I don't want to do this. And you get a year back on unused products. Who's getting really hurt? And it was, w, it was 1099 income. Who's really getting hurt, man? Yeah, this is what I go back to with the perception. It's really interesting. And you almost wonder if it'd be good for the industry if, Herbalife or some of these big companies maybe ran marketing campaigns. Cause I, I gotta be honest, like I, the network marketing industry is not something I would take on. It's just not my skill set, not something I'd be interested in. And, uh, but my perception has certainly changed by watching your videos, the way you've logically break down all the main criticisms by your best friend, Kylie. <laughs> and it is yeah. interesting, just the perception of everyone. And I know, I was a little nervous doing this video because I think a lot of the people that follow my channel are going to be really just dis disappointed to see a video where I just didn't hammer you and didn't call you a scammer at all this. And uh, it's tough. It's really tough changing the perception when you have a, uh, the herd mentality. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said you were, uh, what's your background? Like what'd you study? I was sport management major in college. Okay. And then I, so, I switched over to tech. I'm in tech now. I did a little boot camp, 12 week boot camp. Okay, so when you when you look at your data, what you look at your like study, like the way you think, you think in logic. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm and in tech that, now, very engineer minded. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, so many people, unfortunately, and I see it all the time. You call it the herd mentality, and I think it's a really good way to say it. And that is, can you look? Can you evaluate? People who cannot evaluate a piece of data are forced into the opinion of others, period. 100%. Yep. And so when somebody gets onto a website and they see, like you've mentioned Kylie, and I, I, I did also, I showed you in our show people who ever watched, in the Washington Post, in the Wall Street Journal, when they called me to do an interview, I see that they use manip manipulative words 
And what I think you saw is Tim didn't use any manipulation. I saw you broke down some of the uh, some of the charlatans, and I'm like, it's a great I'm word. glad I just I just use logic. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's the way that I think that that if your crowd were to say, oh man, he turned code on us, you know, then I think that those people should leave because what you what when I watched your channel video, you rocked, man. Thanks. I was like, this guy is legit, right? So because, you know, I never know if I'm walking into an ambush when somebody says, Certainly. hey, are you willing to debate? And I'm like, <laughs> sure, let's do it. Uh, so <laughs> just, just credit to yourself. I would not be like, oh, man, like I actually can see the real data. And, yeah. you know, in my world, when I go – Okay, so if let's go back to those statistics and kind of kind of summarize from there. When I look and I say, okay, so let's say that I want to be a top producer. If I'm going to be a top producer, the pipeline is from here down. Oop, okay. The pipeline is from sell one home down. If I really understand the business of selling, it's the pipeline. It's all that it is. Master generating leads, master contacting people right ac straight across. I can do that in real estate. I can do that in YouTube. I can do that in network marketing. Why would I choose network marketing in all of that choice? Okay. If I'm going to be in the top 1%, it's because of this. If I have to sell, let's say, I don't even know the math, but 400 houses in order to make hundred thousand dollars in real estate. Next year, I got to do that again. And no lie, no exaggeration, 31 years, I've earned a mid six to seven figure income for 31 years. Wow. 15 of those years I was retired. And then my network marketing business bought, me, bought, bought my business from me. So when people say, you don't own your own business, what? Yeah, you do, it's sellable. Why aren't you driving a Lamborghini? Why aren't you out on your videos? Like I'm, I'm Tim Lamborghini sales. All right. So <laughs> many people say this and I was hoping like that people, because see, when you look at the FTC data, man, oh my gosh. Like I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit like concerned because they, here's what they are defining as deceptive. So if you talk about getting rich or lead a wealthy lifestyle, in words or images, such as expensive houses, luxury automobile participants. And then it goes through and you, you can't say father on boss, you can't say stay at home with your kids, you can't say blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wow, um, look at the lottery. Five yeah. million dollars, you're holding a check, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, it's an interesting this, corollary. Like I get an advertisement, follows me around the web about five tiny cryptos. Um, that believes that you can make as much as 5 million richer in as little as 10 oh, trust months. Trust me. And I think, I think what we need to make clear to the people watching this, uh, <laughs> basically, I think we're after the same outcome. That is you're within the industry. You want ethical selling. You want things to be done the right way. You believe that when things are done the right way, people can, can really succeed. I'm a critic on the outside. I look at all industries and when I see unethical behavior, I want to correct it. And so I think the really the last question is essentially when we see, what we would consider unethical selling, uh, unsubstantiated claims, yada, 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 that whole thing. I think we're both after how can we clean this up? And so is there anything that you can think of? How can you make, how can you help make the network marketing industry in, a, in such a way, you know, what can your impact be in such a way that people on the outside have a better perception of it? I appreciate that you're asking this question because I do feel a responsibility for it all. Okay, I've spent my life in it. And so um, I taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a certificate course um, in network marketing. I was interviewed by Larry King, Grant Cardone, and now the famous Spencer. Um, oh, Grant Cardone. Oh, he's a hot <laughs> topic to my audience. Yeah. And so when, when you look at it really and truly, um, there is always going to be a group. I'm going to go back to those grades thing because um, I believe it's the essence in every industry, real estate, in everything, 
I've ever been around, there are always really professionals in that state, that space. And if your audience can just get one thing very valuable, forget that I'm in network marketing and you hate network marketing, right? Forget that for a second. Just the mere fact that I've been able to create a six to seven figure income for 31 years means that I did something right a few times. And this is it. And I learned it in spec ops. What it is, is that the fundamental is training interest. If I can't, and so how do I, when I'm recruiting, somebody's gonna go through my funnel. They're gonna see a video. They're gonna drop into an appointment setter. The setter sends them to me and I'm looking at what they are. What were their excuses in life? What did blah, blah, blah. I'm not interested in what they did as much as what are their excuses. And so when somebody has an excuse why they can't generate a lead or why they can't contact somebody or why they can't whatever, the only solution I have, Spencer, is training interest. Because if they're willing to train, I can help. But if they're not willing to train, I can't sponsor them. They had an opportunity to be mentored by me, but if they cannot and are unwilling to train, I do what real estate does to people. I do what spec ops does to people. I say, you're out of here. You're out of here. Okay, so I will not, and I think that others ought to too. I qualify the person and I say, here's the pipeline. I want you to put, um, this is a very visual thing. This is how all large teams and any elite team is created. It's the way baseball, it's the way basketball, everybody does it. You have to have some minimum. Pop up a standard of something, 10 push-ups. 50 push-ups, whatever it is. In business, you say, put up 10 leads. Do those 10 leads. Well, what am I selling? You send them this video. Okay. Um, in other words, I like to just actually give them 50 leads and say, put 50 across the pipeline. If you're unwilling to do it, no, if you can't take a no, if you can't say, oh my gosh, I need to learn this. Oh my gosh, I need to do this. If you won't do that, then you're not, you're not going to make it because every business requires sales. Somebody sent me an email, he sent me one of those, I, I got baited, okay, I got baited. This guy sent me a LinkedIn request, my assistant replied back, and then I happened to be in it, I saw it, and it said, you know, in these unprecedented times, how are you doing, Tim? I hate and, that question. Uh, and, <laughs> and I go, real good, how about you, sir? And then he fires back with this long spam thing. And at the end of it, I'm like, man, I didn't just delete it. I, I got in and I go, all right, man, I'm an eight figure income earner in the industry and I'm doing this for your own good. Good for prospecting, good. However, you sent spam. That makes us in the network marketing industry, every one of us look bad. It makes us look bad in internet, in like Facebook, all of it. Please go watch this video. And it was a video that I did about the grades. He replied back and he goes, I can't thank you enough. I took two hours of notes or two pages of notes. So I think the more that the industry can look around and see behaviors and say, hey, you know what? You're saying that wrong. Go to this video. Tim did it. Go to this video and watch it. Um, you know, I think that would clean hey. up the industry a lot because the video I made about the MLM is the the FTC came out and they found complaints within various companies. It was it was basically probably your bottom level distributors, the new distributors yeah. that are making. You know, during this health pandemic, I've got this product that can cure the health disease, and that's pretty uns unsubstantiated. I mean that. I think we're both after the same thing. Like, how can we improve this person? From my side, I don't I don't really care because I'm not in the industry. But I do care in that, like, I'm going to point out, you know, unethical selling. And for you, being in the industry, you want to clean it up for the perception to be improved of the industry as a whole. True. 100%. I know this gets out 99.99 .99 of viruses. But I wouldn't dare put it out on the market and say it'll get coronavirus out. You know what I mean? Like, right. one, it's rude. You know, it, it's just rude.
Yeah. So I think we've covered I, I, pretty much everything. All the criticisms I have, I mean, I'm going to mention it in the intro, but the whole pyramid scheme thing, like that's been discussed ad nauseum on your channel. I didn't want to touch on it. Um, I felt like you do a great deconstruction of that, but is there anything and I don't know, anything you can think of? I think we covered it all. Um, no, I, like you ask a lot of great questions and you know, like maybe, maybe there'll be comments or something like that that come in on your channel and they can ask, you know, and things like that. And, and if it's enough or if it's something that you don't feel is as handled, then, you know, we'll, we'll rejoin and we'll do, we'll, we'll for talk sure. about it. I think the importance of this video for me is, so I think if you're going to be a critic, there's a lot of responsibility, especially because some of my videos start to get on the side of, Hey, this isn't ethical. And once you start making those claims, you better be darn sure that you know what you're talking about. And so for me, when I'm going to be a critic, I feel like you need to know the industry just as well as those inside it so that you can critique. And so for me, yeah. this, uh, watching your content, discussing this with you, it is very important so that now I know the industry better. And I want for my audience, when you guys uh, come across MLM network marketing companies and you reach out to me and say, hey, this guy's a scammer, I want you to be more informed so that we as a whole can look at unethical behavior and do so from a much more uh, informed perspective as opposed to just labeling, labeling everyone a scammer. And I think in the same way, you changed my mind about antis. Okay. And I, I don't know if anti is actually the right way to, I'm more of open mind, let me hear about it. But I will say I was a little more on the anti side before I came across your content. Yeah, and a lot of people I feel honestly are just popping up doing anti MLM because it's an easy target, target in the military, we just call them soft targets. Um, and it is, they're just popping up all over the thing. Kylie, she had her videos. She was doing travel and she was doing uh, makeup and she was doing Chicago and, and she would get about 10,000 views or so. Yeah. Um, and then, and 10,000 subscribers, sorry. And then she did an anti-network marketing video and she like popped to the chart. She's never been in network marketing, says so she'll never do it. And so that created fame for her to do anti-network marketing, but I would be willing to bet that in time, what she's going to attract is victims. And those people are very non-responsive. And so if ad require people who are, want to be entrepreneurs, want to do engagement, want to go in and, and get better, then, you know, you get a whole bunch of victims sitting there watching a workout video. They're not going to buy gym equipment from Rogue. They're not right. going to re be responsive. And so it, they're going to end up losing interest anyway. Yeah. So and this is, I think you're... Did what you touched on is actually really important for me because I, I experienced the same thing. My, my growth didn't come off until I started critiquing these people. And I don't like the, the concept of I'm only grow, uh, blowing up because of critiques like I need to make sure that if I'm going to be a critique I want to make sure that I am very informed and I do so in a way that is not harming to others that I'm not spilling libel and so it's important for me to understand the industry and that's why I, I try not to get into that the anti MLM mode where it's just like let me call yeah. everyone a scammer it you gets know, the views I, I, it gets the I views but it's very short term it's very short term I got to give you credit for something all right okay so I love credit I um I'm always fascinated. I own some rental properties, but you know, where do I put my money? I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with the markets, you know, I've got gold, I've got, you know, stocks, I got, I'm just trying to spread it. Right. And so uh, in and around the real estate industry, I was like, who is the knowledgeable one, you know? And so because I was on the inner circle of Russell Brunson, I knew Dean Graciola. Oh, Dean. And Walking so webinar. When I saw your breakdown, I was like, oh, so glad I didn't buy his course. <laughs> so you were, um, no, whole, no, let me just stop. Do not ever want to get into wholesaling, a guy like you, no. Okay. So I did Ed Beckley. I did Carlton Sheets. Uh, that's where I bought my first real estate property. I uh, got into network marketing. I hit, you know, like about 20,000 a month. I moved closer to where I needed to be and I rented that place out. And I got a call one night and it was the U S marshal. And he said, are you the owner of 231 Gardner Avenue? And I said, uh, yes, sir. And he goes, this is the U S marshal. We just had to bust in. It's the largest crack house in Southern Maryland. And I'm like, 
I'll wow. be right down. <laughs> <laughs> they literally busted through, punched holes in the walls. Like it was a mess. And I'm like, I think I like network marketing. <laughs> Cool. All right. We can, so, we can talk more offline. I'm going to go ahead and end it because we're getting timely. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who want to check out your YouTube, do you mind sharing your YouTube name? Yeah. It's uh, network marketing power. Tim sales, network marketing power. Yeah. Yeah. Tim sales, network marketing power. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank Thanks. you very much for your time. This was excellent. Thank you. Hey, you too, sir. <laughs>